Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Ant's first webinar, Nukes Outlawed the Future Without Nuclear Weapons. My name is JV Marasigantangan. I'm from the Philippines, and I will be your moderator tonight. This webinar is organized by Asian Network of Trusts, or Ant Hiroshima, an NGO based in, in Hiroshima, Japan, that pursues projects in international cooperation, international peace building, and peace education. First of all, I'd like to thank all the participants watching via Zoom. We are joined tonight by participants from Japan, the Philippines, the USA, the UK, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, Poland, China, Pakistan, among many others. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Just a few reminders, this webinar will run for less than an hour. Speakers will present first and a panel discussion will follow at the end of all the presentations. All participants should be on mute mode while the session is going on. Please feel free to ask questions at any point of the webinar by using the chat box. Uh, please write your name, your country and organizations and questions will be answered during the panel discussion. With that, let's begin. So following its 50th ratification in October 2020, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or TPNW will come into force five days from now on January 22nd. That means nuclear weapons will now be illegal under international law. This is a landmark achievement for the world. But what does it really mean? How are we affected by this? And what does it mean for us as ordinary citizens living together in a global village? So our friend from Germany, Victor Kropp, will give us some insight as to how radiation affects the human body. It will be followed by a presentation on the intersectionality of nuclear abolition by Anne-Lise Geisbert from Japan. And finally, our friend from ICANN in Geneva, Switzerland, Daniel Hogsta, will deliver his keynote speech on what the nuclear ban treaty is all about and its future. Now we will hear from the executive director of Asian Network of Trust, Hiroshima, Tomoko Watanabe.皆さん、こんにちは。渡辺智子です。私は広島で生まれて育ちました。私の父と母は被爆者です。もうすぐ核兵器禁止条約が発効しますね。国際法になります。75年期間被爆者や広島の市民は心からそれを願って働いてまい
原爆が作られる原爆が投下されて多くの人が亡くなったそういう時に私たちはもうこういう戦争とか核戦原爆とかそういったものは人類は愚かでないからそういうものはなくなるだろうと本当に思ったんですところがまた各地で戦争が起こりそして水爆が開発されミサイルが開発されで非常に危険な状況になっていますそういう中で私たち被爆体験者たちでももうあのだんだん年を取ったり亡くなったりしていますだから私たちにそういった体験とか記録をちゃんと残しておきたいと思うんですが、まあ、若い人たちはそういった、うん、体験者の思いとかそれからいろんな記録とかそういったものを確実に受け止めていただいてそして皆さんが生きていくこれ,らのこれからの世界を本当に核のない平和な世界にしていっていただくように。あの絶,望してや絶望してやりません本当にあの皆さんが今もしまた核戦争でもあったら皆さんがしなく傷つく痛む痛むのは皆さん自身なんですずっと本当に平和な世界が続きますように皆さん。若い人頑張ってくださいお願いです Thank you very much Morishita san As of now the number of hibakusha is decreasing many hibakusha express that they now rely on the younger generations to spread the word And let me quote Emiko Okada another hibakusha from Hiroshima she says I don't want people to just repeat what they read. I want them to actually say how they feel. Nowadays, you can use your phone in a second, you're broadcasting to the world. I really want people to use that and speak to the world. I want people to remember their real human warmth and share that with the world. And by doing that, peace can be achieved. And thank you, Marisha san, for reminding us that. And all the Hibakusha who, despite being in pain for a very long time, remain steadfast in advocating for peace. Now, we are going to talk about the effects of radiation on the human body. And we have our friend from Germany, Victoria Kropp, to give us some insights. Victoria is a graduate student majoring in peace research and international relations at the University of Tübingen, Germany. She interned at Aunt Hiroshima and translated into German a book about medical effects of the atomic bombing written by Dr. Nanao Kamada, who treated survivors of the atomic bomb and conducted research on radiation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Victoria Krapp. I will talk about the effects of radiation on the human body. First of all, what is radioactivity or radiation? This picture is from a book that used fire from a piece of coal as an example to explain radioactivity. Suppose the coal is burning red and you are warming your hands over the fire. You will probably gradually feel warm because of the heat rays produced by the coal. These heat rays are equivalent to radiation, a flow of tiny particles. The coal itself is burning with a flame, and this coal corresponds to radioactive materials. The burning coal has the property to produce heat waves, radiation, and this property is called radioactivity. The next slide is about radiation in our daily life. Everyone receives radiation in daily life because radioactivity is a part of our Earth. Natural radiation includes cosmic waves, which means the radiation we receive from outer space, and gamma rays, which are emitted from natural radioactive materials into the body. Man-made radiation includes radiation from nuclear weapons or other radiation experiments, or from workplace accidents, and it also includes radiation that is used for medical examinations or cancer therapy. The permissible radiation exposure limit is one millisievert each year of one's life. The next slide is about the effects of radiation. 
Whether the source of radiation is natural or man-made, whether it is a small amount or a large amount of radiation, there will be biological effects. The effects of radiation on the human body can be divided into acute disorders, which usually develop within four months from the exposure to radiation, and late disorders, which appears after the four months. Symptoms of acute disorders are, for example, thirst, weakness, fever, vomiting blood, loss of hair, bleeding from gums, and decreases of the red and white blood cells. Late effects on the next slide are, for example, tumors, leukemia, cancer, and growth and development delay in survivors exposed to radiation as fetuses. When you have been exposed to radiation, cancer will not appear in all the organs at the same time. When the human body is exposed Expo to a large amount of radiation at a single time, the time of the occurrence of cancer differs from organ to organ because human cells have different sensitivities to radiation. In general, organs with frequent cell divisions or regeneration are very sensitive to radioactive rays. Next slide, please. During nuclear explosions or other radiation experiments, people were usually exposed to radiation on many parts of the body, and the radiation caused damage to many of the genes at one time. As a result, they developed cancers on various parts of the body easier and faster compared to other people who were not exposed to radiation. So, suffering from two or three cancers, like in this image, is not rare for people who were exposed to high doses of radiation. It is sometimes difficult to understand why some people die while others survive after being exposed to the same amount of radiation. The main reasons are the health of the individuals at the time of the exposure and the ability to combat the effects of radiation exposure. For example, a person already prone to infection who receives a large amount of radiation may be affected by the radiation more than a healthy person. Exposure to radiation is not a guarantee of harm. However, more exposure means more risk and there's no amount of radiation so small that it will not have some effect. That's why we definitely should never allow nuclear weapons to be used anymore. On the next slide is a book recommendation if you want to know more. This book is about the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima at Nagasaki, containing an interview with a survivor from Hiroshima. And all the pictures I used are, um, are also from the book. It is available for free in Japanese, English, French, and German. A Spanish translation is coming this year or the next year. I will post the links in the chat so you can easily access to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, we'll hear from Victoria again later during the panel discussion. Again, if you have questions, please write your full name, country, and organization in the chat box, followed by your question. So it will be the question will be sent privately to the organizers. Now, our friend here in Japan will provide us an intersectional look at nuclear abolition. Annelies Geisbert currently works as a translator and journalist. She previously interned at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, or UNITAR, Hiroshima office, and at Hiroshima. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Annelies Geisbert. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the great introduction, JV. And Victoria, thank you too for your talk. I think it provides some really great background information for what I'd like to talk about today. So as JV introduced, uh, my theme uh, is examining nuclear disarmament as an intersectional issue, meaning how it overlaps with other problems that we are facing in our society. So as we all know, just by watching the news or checking social media, the world is full of problems. And amid all these problems, it can be easy sometimes to see nuclear disarmament as a low priority, especially given its reputation as a really difficult, unsolvable issue 
or a topic that only governments and experts are qualified to address. Uh, in our everyday lives, nuclear weapons can seem really distant from us. However, I think it's past time we do away with these misconceptions. Although nuclear weapons were only used twice in war 75 years ago, the production and testing of nuclear weapons has affected and will continue to affect people around the world. So I'd like to give you a few examples of how. Uh, next slide, please. In the first decade after the Cold War, the US detonated uh, over 60 nuclear bombs at its test site in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. These tests contaminated the environment, forced the evacuation of Marshallese communities, and damaged the health of those in the path of the radioactive fallout from the explosions. So even without their use of war, nuclear weapons can still be deadly. Similar stories can be heard from many nuclear test sites, such as the USSR's test site in Kazakhstan, the French test site in French Polynesia in the Pacific, or the Chinese test site in the recently uh, infamous Xinjiang province. Just from these few examples, I think you can begin to see a pattern as to where nuclear weapon states choose to conduct their tests and who bears the brunt of the damage. Uh, returning to the Marshall Islands, materials contaminated by radiation from the US's nuclear weapons tests are now sealed away under a concrete dome, which you can see pictured here. But as sea levels rise due to climate change, um, the site is, uh, is being threatened by the rising sea levels, meaning it could potentially be damaged and leak hazardous radioactive material. The rising temperatures and increasingly extreme natural disasters caused by climate change present a challenge, to put it lightly, for nuclear waste storage sites in precarious locations around the world. But by the way, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons stipulates that state parties who are part of the treaty, um, which have conducted nuclear weapons tests, have a responsibility to provide assistance uh, to those who have been affected by said tests. So climate change and colonial legacies are just some examples of how nuclear weapons intersect with other social issues. So I'd like to um, bring up one more angle, uh, public finance. Next slide, please. So according to research done by ICANN, in 2019, the nine nuclear weapon states spent a combined 72.9 billion US dollars on their nuclear arsenals. The biggest spender, as you can see here, by far was the US at $35 billion. Recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought public spending into the spotlight even more than usual. So maybe it would be a good time to reconsider the money some of our countries spend on nuclear weapons. These are just a few examples of how nuclear disarmament intersects with other social issues. So what can we average citizens do? As I mentioned earlier, many people think that they can't influence their country's nuclear weapons policies without having specialized knowledge or being in a position of power. But if we look at the history of the TPNW and the global movement that created it, we can see that that isn't the case. Ordinary people do have power. Next slide, please. So to start with, the testimonies of nuclear victims around the world give strength and urgency to calls for nuclear abolition. These survivors are proof that nuclear weapons have affected and continue to affect so many of us. It's the least we average citizens can do to amplify survivors' voices and to ensure that no one else meets the same fate in the future. What's more, today or in the coming week, we're able to celebrate the TPNW's entry into force thanks to the bold leadership of nations predominantly from the global south that signed and ratified the treaty. 
And here's one more point. The TPNW text acknowledges that nuclear weapons have a disproportionate impact on women and girls. And at the same time, women are often at the forefront of the nuclear disarmament movement, as, for example, exemplified in this photo of ICANN Executive Director Beatrice Finn and Hibakusha Setsuko Thurlow, who together accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of ICANN. So there's a clear contrast between the rhetoric of disarmament advocates and the often hyper-masculine posturing of the leaders of nuclear weapons states. Next slide, please. So last but certainly not least, I just wanted to end by emphasizing that it's possible to have fun while advocating for nuclear disarmament. And that's certainly what this unofficial ICANN offshoot, International Queers Against Nukes, or ICWAN, that's they had a lot of fun when they marched in the 2019 New York City Pride Parade, as pictured here. So I hope these few short examples have helped you see how nuclear weapons affect and can be affected by all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Annelise. We'll hear from Annelise again later during the panel discussion. And I think really it's interesting. No, I think that word is wrong. It's shocking how far reaching the effects of like nuclear nuclear weapons and war are. Like it has like impact on many facets of human life. And we'll explore more of that later. Thank you very much, Annelise. Again, now we are receiving some questions from the participants. Good. The, the questions are really interesting. And again, there are so many like newbies and advocates here. I think the the participants are very diverse. So you can ask ask basic questions. You can ask any questions that you feel uh, you'd like to know more about. And if you want to ask a question, please write your full name, country, and organization followed by your question. So we, we really like the questions we're receiving right now. And finally, our friend from Geneva, Switzerland, will tell us what TPNW is all about. So Daniel Hogster is the ICANN campaign coordinator, and his work focuses on supporting the campaign activities and political engagement of ICANN's partner organizations. Since the adoption of the TPNW, his work has focused on supporting the work of ICANN partners in nuclear umbrella, state context, as well as broadening the community of stakeholders that champion the TPNW. He was previously the liaison for ICANN, with a diplomatic corps in Geneva, including the leading ban treaty supporting states. During the TPNW negotiations in New York in 2017, Daniel helped lead ICANN's lobbying team to ensure the treaty reflected ICANN's core principles. Hogster has worked for ICANN since 2012 and has degrees in political science from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and in law from the University of Edinburgh. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Daniel Hogsta. Well, thank you very much, uh, JV, for that introduction. And, and um, thank you so much to Annelise, Victoria, uh, Hiroshi, and Tomoko for those uh, very uh, interesting and engaging uh, talks uh, before me. Uh, it's an honor and, and really a, a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, I've been working with I, I can for eight years. Um, and I know many of you who are uh, watching and listening today have been involved for, for many, many more years uh, than that. So I, I can only imagine um, that the kind of emotion and the, the excitement that I feel um, that the treaty will enter into force uh, next Friday is something that is shared and probably even more meaningful to those of you who have worked on this for so many years. So when uh, Honduras uh, ratified uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, on October 25th, uh, as JV said, they became the 50th state. Uh, and that meant that the treaty had achieved its threshold um, of countries required for it to enter into force. Uh, so what does that mean? What does entry into force uh, mean? Uh, in legal terms, it means that the treaty takes life. It becomes binding international uh, law. 
It is the moment that the treaty moves from um, something that is just a potential, just hope into actual binding international law alongside many other treaties um, that ban weapons and also the treaties that regulate nuclear weapons. This is the culmination of decades of work uh, to save the human race from annihilation that began as soon as the first atomic bombs were developed in the 1940s and of course tragically uh, dropped over Hiroshima uh, and Nagasaki by the United States. So the treaty, uh, the prohibitions, uh, the actions that are banned um, by the treaty and that will become um, alive, if I can use that term, on the 22nd uh, of January is the developing, the testing, producing, manufacturing, transferring, possessing, stockpiling, using, or threatening to use nuclear weapons, or allowing nuclear weapons to be stationed on their territory. So the reason I outline all those things is that you can see that there's lots of different ways that countries are engaged or can be engaged with uh, nuclear weapons. And it's important to categorically prohibit all of those activities so that it's well understood and well defined uh, in international law. Of course, legally speaking, uh, a treaty is only binding upon the states that have ratified it. So only those 50, 51 states now with Benin who has ratified recently will technically be legally bound uh, by this treaty. But to leave it there is really to miss the whole story, the real power uh, of the treaty. And that cannot be underestimated. You often hear ICANN and ICANN partners talk about the power of international norms. Norms of behavior tell us what is considered to be acceptable practice um, by a country and what is considered to be unacceptable. So what is, why are, why are norms uh, important? Well, the, the truth is for any international uh, legal treaty, um, that develops norms that is considered to develop this kind of idea of what is acceptable for a country to do. This is something that is well understood in international law, and you don't see very many countries just acting in a way that totally ignores international law. We have seen some attempts to, you know, reverse it to um, to weaken to weaken international law. Of course, the United States um, and Russia, you know, have had struggles over this New START treaty. Uh, and there's been a whole host of other treaties that relate to nuclear weapons that have been diminished over the last eight years. But the power of norms um, is still reflected if you look at other treaties that regulate weapons. So we saw this, for example, with the ban on cluster bombs and the ban on anti-personal landmines. At the beginning and still today, if you look at the United States, the countries that used those weapons uh, the most, the countries that had those weapons, cluster bombs and, and landmines, were the ones who were really against the treaty, the tre those treaties being developed. They said that they would not work, that they're dangerous, that landmines and cluster bombs are really necessary, really important. Similar language to what you hear them say about nuclear weapons, right? But over time, since these treaties were developed, we saw a shift in behavior. We saw states who still, like the United States, for example, who still refuse to sign these treaties, they start to reduce the role of those weapons, of landmines, sorry, landmines in their arsenals. They, re they reduce the role, um, they reduce the, the amount of money that they spend for it, the amount of um, you know, transfers that they make to other countries, because by and large, the international community starts to see these weapons as unacceptable. Stigmatized is another word that you will hear. No country today is proud to say that they possess and use landmines. And I come back to the United States because they still have not signed a treaty, but in 2013, 2014, about then, they said that they recognized that there was a norm against these weapons. Now, of course, the Trump administration has tried to push back on that a little bit, but it's hard to say that there's no norm against landmines and cluster bombs. The United States itself is the largest donor to landmine clearance. All of that comes from these treaties that prohibit them and the power of the norm against those weapons. We want to put nuclear weapons, and next Friday we will have put nuclear weapons 
when I say we, I mean the broader family of civil society and the governments of academia who have been such an essential part of this, who put nuclear weapons on that same level. On the same, we'll put them on the same level as other weapons that are considered absolutely disgraceful and unacceptable, like chemical weapons and biological weapons, which are the other so-called weapons of mass destruction. Now, finally, nuclear weapons are put in the same category as those weapons illegal under international law and unacceptable by any moral or ethical uh, basis. So we can look at the past uh, and look at the impact of treaties that other treaties have had on state behavior and build a case for how the TPNW will be effective. But if you want a clear example of why the TPNW will work and why we should be optimistic about the power it will have is you just look at the behavior of the nuclear weapon states themselves in reaction to this treaty. They are scared, and rightfully so. Since the beginning, they have been on the wrong foot by this process. They don't want to get rid of their nuclear weapons, these nuclear weapon states. They want to hold on to them. But now, through the humanitarian initiative that raised the humanitarian consequences, you know, as the driving force behind developing new law, other countries, as Annalise referenced, the kind of the global South uh, countries have taken control of the nuclear disarmament narrative, not just the global South, of course, but the base of the support is, is really there. Countries that were dismissed as having nothing to do with nuclear weapons, you know, nothing, no, they don't have them, you know, they don't possess them, they're maybe in some cases far away from the countries that do possess them, but they recognize these countries that nuclear weapons affect everyone in the world, all regions. It's not possible in the event of a nuclear war, if in a limited one, to block yourself off from those effects around the world. You know, as, as JB noted as well uh, in his introduction, these weapons impact on so many different uh, aspects uh, of life. So these countries, recognizing that that's a problem, are now setting the agenda of what is acceptable behavior uh, in the sphere of nuclear disarmament. And the nuclear weapon states are reacting aggressively uh, against this as a sign of fear. You know, we should not be scared or worried that they're act reacting this way. We should be confident that it means that we're on the right track. We're pushing, um, to use that example, like that we're pushing their, we're pushing their buttons. So in what ways are they reacting? Um, many of you may have seen uh, the article that came out uh, in the Associate Press and many other um, outlets around the world before the 50th ratification that the United States was actually putting pressure on countries that had already ratified to withdraw their instruments of ratification, to stop support for this treaty. And that is something that not only the United States, but the other nuclear weapon states have done to other countries uh, around the world. Stop supporting the TPNW. This is not realistic. This is not going to work. This is dangerous, they say. And it's to, sh to put that into context, that is really, um, really scary rhetoric. You know, even in the climate change uh, process, um, you would not expect the United States, you know, and the other major offenders um, of, of, you know, the climate, climate emergency, you don't hear about them putting pressure on other countries to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So this is something that is really uh, an overreaction <laughs> in the nuclear disarmament sphere, and it's something that is a proof that they are panicking. They know uh, that this treaty is going to have an impact. And this really brings me um, to the broader group outside of the nuclear weapon states, these countries that are the problem when it comes to nuclear weapons, because not just the nuclear weapon states themselves, the problem and the fault and the blame also lies with the countries that claim to rely on nuclear weapons for their national security. Many of you are joining from, from Japan and you, you of course know the position of Japan in this, in this respect. And there's many countries in the NATO nuclear weapons, the NATO alliance who are also claiming that nuclear weapons are important for their national security. And what the TPNW does, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons does, is it puts these countries in the spotlight. They have for many years been able to get away with saying that, no, we just need them for our defensive security. You know, it's the nuclear weapon states that are the problem. But no, 
It's these countries that are protecting the nuclear weapon states by claiming to rely on nuclear weapons, by lending credibility and legitimacy to these weapons. And that is something that is going to be increasingly difficult for these countries to do. They're going to be coming under increasing scrutiny and now. And it's already started to happen. It's already started to happen since 2017, but with the treaty entering into force, becoming binding international law, many of these countries, I'm from Sweden, my country is not part of a nuclear umbrella, but it's also one of these countries that is trying to sit on the fence. This will be the first treaty on weapons, uh, legal prohibition on weapons that Sweden has not joined. And that is going to be incredibly difficult for Sweden to answer. And there's many other countries that will find themselves under the same amount of scrutiny and pressure. And we're already seeing some modest steps in the right direction. And I want to mention a couple here very quickly. These are just the most recent examples. Belgium uh, is a country that hosts nuclear weapons on its soil. These are, they're not Belgian weapons, they belong to the United States, um, but Belgium has, Belgium has an air base where these nuclear weapons are based. And Belgian pilots are, you know, uh, in control of these weapons, if it was to come, if the United States was to give to the order to bomb them, Belgian pilots would um, would use these weapons. And this is something that has never been, um, it was never democratically agreed that Belgium would accept these weapons onto their soil. It was something that just happened during the Cold War. And then one day, you know, people woke up and there were nuclear weapons in Belgium. So it's been controversial for a long time, but the Belgian government has been managed have been managing to get away with it for a long time. In, um, as many of you might not be familiar with the Belgian political context, um, but there was a long negotiations to establish a coalition uh, government there. And one of, the, one of the most difficult issues in those negotiations among these different parties uh, was the issue of the TPNW. And then uh, at the end of the negotiations, one of the final things that was agreed to was that the Belgian government would positively uh, consider the TPNW um, examine it and see how it could benefit multilateralism. Now, that might just sound like political talk, vague political talk, but it is the first example of an umbrella state that promises to positively consider the TPNW. That, in the words of uh, the, the songwriter Leonard Cohen, is a crack through which the light can shine. That is uh, an opening that gives us hope, right? It's, it may be in the Belgian context, it has its own um, relevant and importance, but it's something that other countries will look at and be like, okay, it's, it's, it's possible, you know, it's possible to be within an umbrella alliance, it's possible to be in NATO in the European context, it's possible to both be in a military alliance in the United States and still work for getting the TPNW um, to become powerful. So uh, that's something that obviously the campaigners in Belgium will work on, but it's also an example that other states uh, can emulate. Just very quickly, um, there's going to be a spate of elections, uh, a bunch of elections this year um, in, in these umbrella contexts. Germany is one of them, another country that hosts nuclear weapons. Um, the German Green Party is expected, you know, if you look at the polls today, they are expected to do very well and expected to become part of the next coalition government with who we don't know, but they're expected to do very well. Their Green Party uh, has passed a resolution at, the, at their political congress that says that they are committed to getting Germany to signing and ratifying uh, the TPNW. That is a, that, you know, politics being what it is, you know, you can never be 100% sure. That's why our work is, you know, all of our work here today is, is so important. We have to push that forward. But it's a clear example of commitment. And then there was a, a few more examples that I can raise maybe in, uh, later on in, in the panel discussion, but um, with a view to time, um, I just want to say that we're already seeing uh, political progress being made towards this. And I know that there's examples that many of you can, can look at uh, in Japan and, and, and share as well. But we should be excited. We should be emotional because it is an emotional moment. We should be excited and we should be focused for the next step because there's a lot of work that remains to be done. Um, but given <laughs> looking, at the, looking at the power of civil society and having pushed this, pushed this process through, we should be really confident as well that we can uh, make the most of this moment. We can make the treaty a success and not only a new piece of international law, but the new driving game changer for nuclear disarmament. So thank you very much again for, for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and comments.
Thank you, JD. Thank you very much, Daniel. And now we are going to have our panel discussion. And we have some interesting questions from different people, actually. And are you ready? OK. <laughs> so hello again, everyone. OK, we are ready. So thank you again for your uh, insights about different topics. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Annelise. And thank you, Daniel. We have a question from, uh, before I read the first question, I would like to remind everyone that you can still ask questions. Keep those questions coming. If you don't have a question, you can also send some comments or like if you, if you don't agree, so you can also like send us some messages. Again, please introduce yourself, your organization, your country, and then followed by the question or the comment. So the first question is from Anne Sheriff. I apologize if I mispronounced it. Uh, Anne is from Oberlin College in the US. So thank you for this panel. In addition to marching in the streets, what are some other ways that ordinary citizens can work against nuclear weapons? So maybe Annelies can answer that. <laughs> um. All right, let's see. Especially um, given that we have so many uh, viewers from Japan today, I think an important point is that ordinary citizens in a democracy, they have the right and they can interact with their uh, political representatives in the diet or in their Congress, whatever system it is. Um, but my what I hear from Japanese friends is that it's very uncommon for people to uh, directly engage with their representatives. So my, I guess, biggest point of advice for people in Japan would be to make contact, whether it's by phone or by email or by requesting an appointment um, to go have a chat with their politicians. Um, and I heard, I believe it was last summer, I hope I'm getting this quote right, but I believe it was Hiroshima Governor uh, Yuzaki who said that Politicians do want um, specialists or activists or people, uh, citizens who are engaged and care about these issues to come talk to them because uh, politicians don't have all the answers for every issue. So collaboration between civil society and uh, local government or national government is really, really important for making progress together because one side can't do it on their own. Um, activists won't, or civil society can't create an international treaty on their own and governments probably will not necessarily have the necessary inertia to take that step on their own so it's um you achieve the most effects and the most powerful partnership by working together so that would be one of my uh one piece of advice especially for japan maybe maybe the rest of you have something to add Sure, I, I can add just a, a few things. I think that was perfect, uh, Annalise. I really would emphasize the, you know, the, the collective spirit and the, you know, working together on these things. And if I could just uh, mention some of the initiatives that that ICANN is working for that um, would be relevant for for any country. There's the ICANN Parliamentary Pledge, which of course uh, has had some adherence in in both Japan and, and the United States, where the question uh, was from. And you know, Annalise laid it out very well about how you. You, know, you can get people to to join that but i mean i guess the importance of it is that it is a practical thing that a uh, congressperson member of parliament whatever it's called in your country can sign up to and you know as a as a constituent you know they're obligated to respond to you about these kind of things so i would urge you to to write to your uh, own representative whether it be at the national level or also the local level and uh, from the local level i can also have something called the i can cities appeal uh, which has been uh, supported and we're really thankful for for the cooperation and collaboration with Mayors for Peace uh, in, in that respect. Um, it's a commitment that a city or local authority can take in support uh, of the treaty. Uh, and Lisa also uh, touched on that kind of aspect as well. Finally, um, there's the, the money aspect and I find myself just you know, very inspired by what Annalise's presentation, obviously she talked about the money that goes towards uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, it's not only the countries that are spending those those uh, those dollars. It's also the financial. It's also the producers. You know that are the, that are the problem there. The com companies that make nuclear weapons, um, and those companies in turn are financed by banks, many of whom, you know, are retail banks that many of us have our money in. Uh, so there's something called the Don't Bank on the Bomb Report, uh, which you can see whether your bank 
is you know investing in nuclear weapons uh, and you can take action to get them to stop doing that thanks Judy yeah I'm interested like will it work if we what's the best thing to do do we write a letter to them do we like just flat out boycott the bank like, like change our account like like what's what's like an example that you can give that's a very good question because uh, oftentimes it is quite you know it's very difficult for most of us to you know withdraw all our money from a bank and go to a different bank I mean sometimes it can be possible but it's a difficult step and if it's a pension fund for example you might not even have the choice of you know removing your money from that pension fund because it's something that's set by your employer or your school or, or something like that but uh, there are tools available you mentioned uh, letter writing that is something that uh, that can can be done there are a lot of tools on the don't bank on the bomb website um, to this effect so i'd urge everyone to take take a look at that there is also the public shaming things a lot of these companies a lot of these banks are very very sensitive to what's said about them on social media so one thing that I can and, and partners have been doing is to coordinate campaigns that are focused at certain banks and urge them to change their policy uh, as it concerns uh, nuclear weapons, which uh, it's important to recognize many of them will have to do now with the TPNW as a you know, official legal treaty, because a lot of banks say that they base their policies on what the international law says. Um, so a lot of them will be going through those kind of review processes. Um, and if they hear from their uh, customers, that only makes it more um, important for them to do so. Yeah, and uh, TPNW is now like creating pressure to for for these companies and like banks and corporations to change their policies, and that's like a good start. <laughs> okay, now we have a question from AJ Koi Koi, a master's student at Hiroshima University, uh, in IDEC. Uh, he is also an intern at Unitar Hiroshima office. So this is for all the speakers. The question is, with TPNW coming into force, how do you imagine Japan with its distinct history will move forward, although currently under the United States nuclear umbrella? Yeah, but by, di by distinct history, I think this is about like, because Japan is the, is one of, it's an A-bomb country yeah, with both Hiroshima and Nagasaki suffering the blows. So maybe, Victoria, can you, Give, can you share us your insights about that? Well, of course, I hope that Japan will join the TPNW and not only like sign it, but really ratify it. Uh, but actually, I think that's not really going to be the case because like the Jap like a lot of people think that you have the Japan US security treaty and that's why you can't join the TPNW. Of course, that's not the case. Even with this security treaty, you can join the TPNW. But I think it's still common in the minds of many people that you can't join such a treaty because it could be that you lose the, um, like the status of being an umbrella country. So I think first of all, the people need to understand that being an umbrella country it doesn't mean that you are safe for the whole time. And it doesn't mean that even if you don't have like the, um, the security provided by the US state that you are unsafe. So that's also the case. Even without this umbrella status, you are a safe country. Thank you. How about you, Annalise? What's, what are your thoughts about this question? Hmm. Yeah, I think it's a difficult question because um, in Japan, the national government or the majority of the national government is so deeply attached to the US nuclear umbrella. Um, but on the other hand, the Japanese public is very anti-nuclear, at least in theory. Um, people often uh, call Japan uh, as, or say Japan has a quote unquote nuclear allergy um, because the public just does not want to have anything to do with nuclear weapons. And I actually recently saw a, um, a scholarly article that had done a survey and found that they, it was like 70 or 75% of the Japanese public would support Japan ratifying the TPNW. And even if these survey res respondents, they heard arguments against the TPNW, like for example, 
um, it's not compatible with the MPT or now is not the time, we have a dangerous security environment around us. The respondents did not change their opinion significantly. Still, the majority of people, around 70%, would support Japan joining uh, the TPNW. Um, so from this, these results, you can really see a, such a clear split between um, the position of the Japanese government and the position of the Japanese public. So like I said in my response to the previous question, um, if the public uh, would become more engaged and put more pressure on their representatives to uh, truly represent the public's views on this issue, I think there could be change. Um, but Japan has for decades relied on the US's umbrella. So um, I definitely acknowledge that it's difficult to change the status quo. Yeah, Daniel, do you have any extra insight? No, I don't know what I can add to what Victoria you have said, which is uh, spot on. I, I think, um, yeah, you, you really will see, I think, uh, you can almost rely on the fact that the Japanese government will uh, continue to try to uh, avoid this treaty. Um, and I mean avoid in that, you know, not want to talk about it, you know, not want to uh, engage with it, um, because they know, as, as Annalise put out very difficultly, that it's something that the Japanese public feels very strongly about, um, and the government is maybe not necessarily reflecting um, this, uh, this support. And that just speaks to how important it is to, you know, hold them to account uh, on this question. Thanks, JV. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, and this is for Daniel again. So this is from Vincent Bautista from the Philippine Information Agency 10. I think this is region 10. And the question is, how can we glo as global citizens push countries with nuclear weapons such as the USA, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, et cetera, et cetera, to give up their weapons, especially when their justification is national safety and defense? Mm. True. Yeah, I mean, um, that, is, that is the key question, right? Um, I mean, I think what you, have to, what you have to stick to is very much, um, you know, to, to what Victoria presented. You stick to the facts about nuclear weapons. Um, what do nuclear weapons actually do to people? Um, what are they, um, you know, how, how do they impact the human bodies? How do they impact uh, the environment? Look at the facts throughout history and analyze, have nuclear weapons actually kept us safe? Or is it, is it a history of luck? And I think more and more information and research is being released now that shows that it's mainly luck that has prevented another nuclear weapons uh, disaster. And then of course, uh, as Annalise put in her presentation, the, the history of uh, nuclear testing shows that these weapons, you know, since Hiroshima and Nagasaki have continued to have been used uh, and have disproportionately uh, impacted indigenous communities and you know, women and girls within those, within those communities. So it's a, it's a legacy of harm uh, it's a legacy of, of terror and it has not actually, you know, whose security are we, are we talking about here when we talk about uh, nuclear weapons? So those kind of uh, humanitarian arguments, the facts are on our side in this and those are some things that we can use very strongly. Um, uh, but of course we have to build the kind of political and the, the local uh, support uh, as well and that's why events uh, like this one are so uh, important uh, and, and necessary in terms of raising uh, awareness. Um, many people uh, in a lot of countries, even nuclear weapon states themselves, might not realize um, the depth of the problem with nuclear weapons. They might not realize what their country countries do in relation to nuclear weapons. And finally, I would just say that we have to build on, and I tried to touch on this with Belgium uh, as well, as we have to build on the successes that we see in other countries and try to uh, mimic those uh, in our own and continue to build the case that um, to change the narrative that nuclear weapons are on their way out. The era of nuclear weapons is coming to a close and now it's a matter of do you want to be on the front, uh, on the front side, do you want to be ahead of this argument or do you want to be one of the last governments, the last countries that has a relationship with these immoral and disgusting uh, weapons and that's something I think more and more politicians are going to realize no matter uh, where they are, you know, no matter where, if there's a vibrant civil society there uh, that can push them on this or not. It's something that will uh, affect the political sphere of the world um, all over. Thank you very much, Daniel. And now uh, we have a question for Annalise. So the, the, actually there's a comment. Thanks for your fantastic presentation. 
<laughs> One question from, from my part. Uh, this is from Manabu Teramoto from Hiroshima, Japan. So one question from my part concerning the relationship between COVID-19 and the campaign you have all mentioned. Do you think the pandemic is making the TPNW campaign difficult to work on non-signatory countries? Have you found that, Daniel, in your work? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, it's definitely been very difficult to um, organize uh, events. Obviously, Zoom is, is an amazing tool and others like it, but it has been very difficult to, you know, oftentimes uh, in terms of getting signatories to join, it's about developing a personal rapport, a personal relationship, a relationship of trust with individual diplomats and government officials, you know, and a lot of that isn't very possible or natural through um, these digital spheres. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that uh, many countries are really um, prioritizing uh, their response to COVID-19 and that takes up a lot of focus and a lot of uh, resources. So it's definitely been um, a, a challenge over the last few years, but uh, I think we should all, all of us here should be very proud that we managed to reach uh, 50 uh, last year, even in spite of those uh, difficult campaigning uh, circumstances. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we're going a little bit over time, like, uh, but we have a few more questions. Are the speakers okay with like extending a little bit just to accommodate the last few questions? Is everyone okay? Okay, and for the participants, uh, I know we only said like until 8 p.m. like Japan time, but if you are willing to stay, so you can stay. <laughs> and if not, we are going to post like uh, a live stream, oh no, not, not a live stream, but a video of this webinar on and Facebook account and YouTube account. Okay, so the next question is from Kyoka Mitake from Japan. This is for Victoria. Do you think we can eliminate nuclear weapons completely? Of course, to eliminate nuclear weapons is our goal, but I feel like the current world situation depends on nuclear weapons when it comes to military affairs. Yeah. I think that it will be possible in the future to get rid of all the atomic weapons and um, I think like it, it will be a, like even if the TPNW comes into force we still have a long way to go until this happens but I think there are a lot of people working a lot of young people are working and I think the future generations will also work on like completing this mission get rid of all the atomic weapons so I think that's like a Go that we always should have in mind and that's definitely can happen if we all work together like not only like a few peace advocates but also like normal people can just like for example you can go out tomorrow and start talking with your family and friends about this webinar what you have learned like what is what I can does and stuff like that. So it's not even that you need to be active on a political level. You can just start in your own environment with your own like colleagues and stuff like that and just tell them what you learned, what you know, and then tell them, okay, now it's your turn. Please spread what I said to you. So I think that's an important step forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. And okay, this question is for Annalise. And this is from Mark McPhillips from the UK. I absolutely agree with what you say about abolition being shunted down the priority list due to more visible issues. What do you think we can do to make the average Joe see this as an issue that affects all of us, even in the post-Cold War era? Hmm. Well, I hope, let's see, now I hope what I said in my presentation um, gave a couple of hints as to that, but I think just making, um, showing the simple connections for people between nuclear weapons and uh, their daily lives, like if they live in a nuclear weapons state, say like oh, X amount of their tax money is paying for nuclear weapons, wouldn't you rather have that go to your health care, for example? Um, and also, like uh, Daniel mentioned in response to a previous question, reframing the narrative and showing people that nuclear weapons continue to, uh, act to cause harm to people around the world 
especially people in um, uh, minority communities. Uh, so I think if people already have um, an awareness or an interest in social justice issues, then if you show them these connections, then it hopefully shouldn't be too hard to get them to care about uh, nuclear, nuclear disarmament as well. And also, um, one more point, something I find very inspiring is looking at um, like really strategic work by campaigners such as ICANN um, and to see the practical things they're doing and then the practical results that the uh, campaign has achieved, um, even in such like in the span of 10 years, for example. Um, I think, yeah, one, showing the connections and two, showing the successes that have been achieved so far show people that it's not impossible to make progress on this issue are two key points. Thanks for your question. Okay, thank you very much, Annelise. Okay. Okay, moving on to the next question. This is from Dino Gurdon. I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Any ideas in what way we can have the NATO countries to sign and ratify the TPNW treaty? And in what way can we engage civil society in influencing their own governments? I, I'll have Daniel answer this one. Yeah, sure. No, that's something that I, you know, focusing about thinking about, um, you know, quite a lot. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there's lots of ways of coming at this question, but uh, I think uh, I can I can share with you here that we're, we're going to be releasing some polls here, some surveys in NATO countries uh, in Europe on the on the 22nd next Friday. And, uh, you know, I don't think I'm hopefully not breaking embargo by saying that, you know, this, these polls will show that there is, um, you know, you know, people aren't really aware of the, of the problem and people aren't aware of how their, how their own countries are related to the nuclear weapons uh, problem. Right. So once they are uh, made aware of this, um, they are react quite strongly. Um, they feel that nuclear weapons, you know, shouldn't, their should, country should not have any relationship uh, with nuclear weapons. So the awareness thing, um, it's hard to... You know, it's hard to get around that as, as the primary uh, starting point. I know you've heard that um, from all of us um, earlier in this in this webinar, but it's really that's so crucial. Um, also, we need to focus on uh, small steps, small steps politically that these countries uh, can take. You know, it's not realistic to expect that a country like you know Italy that has you know hundred around hundred nuclear weapons on their soil to to U.S. Um, to bases where they cooperate with the United States on this to join and ratify the GPNW uh, tomorrow. You know, that's, that's, that's not realistic. Uh, what we have to do is focus on the, on the small interim steps that can get Italy um, to that position. Um, and one of those steps is uh, getting these governments to, uh, or engage, it's starting a political process in the parliament to investigate the treaty, uh, what it's about, uh, what would it mean for your country? Uh, you're referencing NATO, so what would it mean for, you know, Portugal um, to join uh, the, TPN, the TPNW, given that it's in NATO, right? And, you know, we've done lots of research on this. We know, of course, that uh, from our perspective, there's no legal problem. There's only political uh, obstacles, right? Uh, but that's something that each country can do an investigation along those lines, mandated by parliament, um, using, you know, budget from, from the government as well to investigate those kind of things. That's something that's possible that most legislators can, can contribute to. And then, of course, um, there is um, the uh, official uh, position of the country vis-a-vis -vis the uh, meetings of states' parties of the treaty. So that's something I didn't mention in my talk, but, but once the TPNW enters into force, within a year, there will be a meeting of the countries um, that are part of this treaty. Um, but in addition to those, uh, well, hopefully there'll be well over 51 countries um, by that point, but even the countries that haven't uh, joined yet, they can participate as uh, observers. They can join uh, and engage in the conversation. That doesn't mean that they, you know, can get away with just being an observer for, forever, um, but it does mean that you're pulling them into the process. They're beginning a discussion uh, around what the TPNW uh, means. Uh, and they can also, you know, be informed and inform from others and share their, their knowledge. That's something that's, that's very important. And, and I think from a campaigning uh, standpoint, um, you know, very strategic uh, and important. So humanitarian arguments, the awareness, and then uh, strategy from a political uh, perspective, 
um, knowing that we have the research uh, on our side um, with respect to how the TPW would relate to uh, the NATO alliance. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And our next question is for Victoria. And this is from Shojiro Tanaka from Japan. To every corner of Japan, overseeing a certain foreign country is making an effect, and it may be dangerous to explicitly announce your position. Now, here in this moment, our conversation is being watched, and that may, be, that, that may result in affecting your job. So maybe the same situation in Germany. Is there an effective way to openly declare your position here? What do you think, Victoria? Yes, in Germany, you can like tell your opinion openly to everyone. And I know that the German section of ICANN is doing a lot to like um, influence all the politicians that are, that are still not um, in favor of the uh, TPNW and other political parties. Like Daniel said, our Green Party is also like pushing this topic forward. And um, I think a lot of people who think they can't like openly tell their opinion um, are just still a little bit afraid like what what can be the consequences um, I have when I like tell other people my opinion but I think we should like overcome this like fear and and just tell other people what we think because we are not alone like a lot of people think the same like we are like right now at the webinar we are over 70 people who are joining it and i think everyone joined it because everyone is some like kind of in favor of the tpnw and wants that nuclear weapons are not used anymore so you are not alone with your opinion so feel free to share your opinion your thoughts with other people because there are a lot of people who are doing this and a lot of people um, who are also like a little bit afraid or feel fear to like openly um, tell others their opinion. Thank you very much, Victoria. And now we just have this, we, we're, we ran out of time. So we, I'm just going to ask this last question. And this is for Daniel and Annalise. It's, it's a similar question. And it's from Aya Yoshimoto from Japan. Some people seem indifferent and or reluctant to share their opinions when talking about issues like this, like nuclear weapons. What do you think we can do to involve others in this discussion? Annalise? Okay, I'll go first. Um, something that I find kind of particular to um, how this issue is talked about in Japan is that people are very, very serious when they discuss it. And I think that's totally natural um, because Japan has Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then also, of course, the um, Daigo Fukuri Maru, the Lucky Dragon number no. five incident, which was exposed to radioactive fallout. Um, and then even the Fukushima nuclear accident. I think uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear issues are very a very serious topic in Japan, but I think that sort of makes people afraid to say their opinion or to say that they care or are interested about this. Or maybe, of course they care, but it's more difficult to bring it up in kind of a light and casual way. Um, so what I think is really important is just to have fun. I personally uh, enjoy learning about nuclear weapons. I enjoy learning about disarmament and the progress that's been made throughout history. I enjoy learning about what's happened in Japan and what's happened all over the world. Um, and I think if you show your, your passion um, and hopefully that will be infectious and other people will uh, learn to share your passion and have fun as well. Um, because I think the uh, nuclear, nuclear disarmament and the TPNW are a really positive thing. Um, so there's no reason why you can't have a good time while you're working for nuclear disarmament. Yeah, Daniel, what do you think? I think uh, yeah, I think that that's a really that's really really good point. And and I mean, I think when you're speaking with people uh, about the nuclear weapons issue, I mean, let's be honest, it, it's you know for most people it's not something. Uh, I don't want to speak for the Japanese context, but you know other countries they work with, it's not the first thing 
uh, that comes into people's minds about an issue that they're really, really passionate about. I mean, obviously, I think everyone that's on this call, you know, we're all uh, advocates or we want to be advocates. Uh, and we expect people to have the shame, you know, to be burning for this issue in the same way that, that we are. Um, but uh, there's two things uh, here. I mean, uh, Annalise spoke about the inter intersectional uh, approach um, uh, to this issue in, in her talk. And it's, it's so crucial because um, most people have a cause that they are uh, burning for. And in all, in all uh, likelihood, um, there is a link to nuclear weapons uh, there. Uh, the nuclear weapons uh, legacy uh, has a history of uh, colonialism and, and racism, you know, and that could be something that that is, you know, an issue that you know someone is 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 passionate about uh, right now. And there's links to that. The nuclear weapons has that has that legacy as well. I mean, obviously, if you're someone who's interested in uh, the environment, in the climate, um, you know, the climate process, there is an, in, there is a relationship and an impact. Uh, there, not only the harm that has been done, but also um, by the tests, but also the harm um, that would be done if there was even one uh, nuclear weapons detonation. And of course, if there were several that would have um, climatic, climatic um, impacts, it would change the global climate, it would destroy um, agriculture and land all over the world, not just in the region that there is a, a nuclear war. So there's all these different aspects to the nuclear weapons uh, issue. So of course, we mentioned finance as well. Um, that there is a link to nuclear weapons in that. So you have to find out what the person is interested in um, and you know, discover if there's a link to nuclear weapons in there. Because in all likelihood, given how uniquely and you know, horribly de devastating these weapons are uh, and the legacy of them, there will be, there will be a, a link there. And I just want to end with, um, I just, well, reiterate, I'm just going to steal again what <laughs> Annalise says, but I think it's a really good point. That she made about having having fun, you know, and celebrating the small victories. Um, most of the movies or most of the media that you see about nuclear weapons presents it in really devastating tones, uh, and apocalyptic tones. I think that um, you know can can make people feel like well, I don't really want to engage in this in this question, despite the fact that they might also feel very profoundly moved by the stories of the, the Hibaku show. Um, but it's important to look uh, at these kind of small victories that have been had uh, along the way. I know I'm just repeating on leaf here, so I apologize. That. But it, to focus on these small victories and show that it is possible. There is a, there is a line from here to, towards victory to nuclear abolition. Uh, it might be a long one, but there is a link and we can, we can plot that pathway forward through focusing on these small victories that really anyone can be uh, engaged in and, and get excited about. And thank you very much, Daniel. We have received so many great questions this evening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer them all. You can always comment or messages on our social media accounts if you want to discuss anything further. Our Instagram is, uh, I mean, we're going to show the our Instagram and Facebook and YouTube handles. So our Instagram is at, at friends underscore Hiroshima. And our Facebook account is facebook.com. Uh, slash ant dot Hiroshima, and you can also follow us on YouTube. Our YouTube is ant dash Hiroshima. We will upload the webinar on our Facebook and YouTube accounts. Thank you very much, and once again, thank you to our speaker. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Annelise. It's all this is very enlightening for me too. And when you mentioned like volunteering, I, I, I myself I'm a volunteer at, at Ant Hiroshima, and I'm joined by my friends Daisy Whitby and Andrew Meekan, who's helping in the background. Let's give a round of applause. We'll just clap for all the people in the background, busy, busy, busy helping us. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to all our attendees. So the work of Aunt Hiroshima is motivated by Hiroshima's experience and memory as an A-bomb city. Like ants, we may have little power alone, but by working together with other organizations and individuals from across the world, we believe peace in the world can be achieved. With the message and spirit of Hiroshima in our hearts, we move forwards in our effort. Have a peaceful day or evening, wherever you're from, everyone, and good night. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, Tomoko-san, hello. <laughs> oh, hi, Tomoko-san, how are you? Hello. <laughs> Tomoko-san, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Tomoko-san, you can unmute. <laughs> 
Everyone, thank you. Thank you very much. Arigato. <laughs> bottom heart to you all. Thank you. Arigato. Thank you. See you. See you. Okay, everyone, let's just stay for a little bit longer. Like, let's just take a screenshot. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Have a wonderful and peaceful evening, everyone. Uh, this is just the first of webinar series, and we, we hope to have more webinars in the future. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Arigato.